Hello, I'm Joshua Unruh, Superhero Scholar. Welcome to Superhero University on Batgirl of Burnside. Session number two, the Burnside College Try. Have a seat. Class is now in session. Hello and welcome to the second session in the Superhero University for Batgirl of Burnside. I am your superhero scholar, Joshua Unruh. We are going right into session two, the Burnside College Try. It is from Batgirl issue number 36 by Cameron Stewart, Brendan Fletcher, and Babs Tarr. Brendan Fletcher and Cameron Stewart sharing the writing duties on that uh, with Babs Tarr and Cameron Stewart sharing the visual duties. Babs Tarr is mostly known for her illustration, but she credits Cameron Stewart with a lot of the visual tics that we have talked about in the last session and we'll talk about into this one. Before we go very far into this session, I want to talk about one piece of information that we chatted about in the last session and just bring out a few more examples of that. Susie, one of my lovely patrons, asked about examples of Batman using his villain's pathology to defeat them. There are so many of these. There's so many that I'm actually having trouble going to my collection of comics or video or whatever and trying to find specific examples. But I have a few. These are not all brilliant examples, but they are something of what I'm talking about. Basically what I mean by Batman defeating his villains through their pathology is when he turns their gimmick, their obsession, back on them and beats them with that thing. So, when he outriddles the Riddler, right? When he figures out a way to turn Two-Face's focus on duality against him. There are so many of these examples. I'm going to look at Batman the Animated Series for some of the easiest ones to find, and I'm going to do that for a couple of reasons. One is, those are at your disposal, at your fingertips, if you are an Amazon Prime customer, and you can go watch them right now. And I kind of recommend that you do. But if you don't have time right now, that's okay, because that leads us to our second reason that I'm going to look at BTAS for a minute, which is I am currently in process of producing a BTAS podcast. It will be called an animated discussion about Batman the Animated Series. My fantastic co-host is Caleb Masters, who I work with at thecinematropolis.com and who has done a ton of movie and film reviews and analysis, both on his own and as part of the Good Trash Media Network and now with Planet Thunder Productions, the local Oklahoma City production company that is backing thecinematropolis.com. So Caleb and I will be taking an in-depth look at Batman the Animated Series on a podcast soon. And so if you haven't ever had that pleasure and you don't have the time right now to go look at these examples I'm going to give you, we will be talking about them in depth on that podcast. There are a couple of really great examples, and many of them come very early in the series. So we're going to take a look at these Batman the Animated Series episodes, and clearly, spoilers are on the table, so get ready for those, okay? So, Pretty Poison is the first appearance of Poison Ivy, and it comes very early in the first season, because they're introducing all these villains, and she's one of the ones they want to introduce. And for those of you that don't know, Poison Ivy's deal is that she loves plants. She thinks that humans are destroying the world, starting with plant life, and she actually loves plants more than human beings. She thinks plants are more important than humans, and eventually kind of becomes a plant person herself. But that is down the road from what we're talking about right now. Right now, she's just a human being who loves plants. And as part of that episode, she is using a rare, nearly extinct rose to create a poison so that there is no antidote. And as Batman comes to apprehend her in her greenhouse hideout, he is poisoned, he is wounded, there is a raging fire, and he falls into a trap door, and she has got her crossbow trained on him, and Poison Ivy is going to kill Batman. She's going to finish him off. And he holds up the rare, nearly extinct rose. And it's clear that he's using it as a hostage 
if she shoots him, it will go down the trap door right along with Batman and she'll lose it. And so she gives him the antidote and he gives her the plant and he is able to take the antidote and climb up out of the, the trap door and save them both from the raging fire. He's in a rough spot, but he's definitely using Poison Ivy's obsession, her pathology, against her to win. Another couple of great examples, and th this scene has actually been reused a few times, so I'm not 100% sure where it was, but I know that one of the places I've seen it is in Batman the Animated Series with Two-Face. And it might even be the second part of the Two-Face origin story. We haven't covered that one in the animated discussion yet, so I haven't re-watched it recently. But this is one place where Batman is captured by Two-Face and his men, and they are in a casino, and Two-Face flips the coin. That's, and for those of you who don't know, that's Two-Face's pathology. He is all about duality. Everything is left to chance. It's either, bi it's binary. It's either plus or minus, one or zero, good or evil. And he is split down the middle himself with scars on one side of his face and handsome Harvey Dent on the other side of his face. And so he uses a coin that is also two-headed, but one side is scarred to represent that choice. He flips that coin. So in this particular instance, Two-Face has captured Batman, and they are in a casino, and Batman reminds him he has to flip the coin to decide if he can kill Batman. And that alone kind of upsets Two-Face because he's ready to kill his nemesis, right? So he flips the coin, and while the coin is flipping through the air, Batman reaches over to one of the gambling tables and throws a handful of coins up over Two-Face's head so that it mixes with the coin that he flipped as they're falling down. And then Two-Face can't find the right coin. He, and he can't just pick them all up and start over because the coin has made the decision, right? He has to find the coin so he can see what the coin decided. And so he is trapped in that moment unable to act in any meaningful way other than looking for his coin while Two-Face is involved in that situation. Batman is able to take care of the rest of Two-Face's goons and then Two-Face himself. So there's some, some ways that Batman has used the pathology of his villains against them, like used it as a weapon to thwart them. Remembering back to the last session of Batgirl of Burnside, I mentioned that Barbara, as Batgirl, uses Riot Black's pathology against him and that I felt this was very much in character to be a thing she had learned from Batman. The reason I say she learned it from Batman is this is a thing he does a lot and that she was clearly doing that to Riot Black. Riot Black is all about getting the information that nobody else has and then using it against people on his website. I talked about Bat editor extraordinaire Dennis O'Neill. One of the things that he did was jealously guard the secret identity of Batman and therefore the rest of the Bat family. In some instances, he jealously guarded it to the point that it did not make sense. For instance, the Teen Titans all knew that Robin was Dick Grayson, but somehow none of them knew that Batman was Bruce Wayne. Like, it just did that. Sometimes Denny made choices that didn't make sense. But the jealous guardianship of the Bat family secret identities is a thing that I can actually get behind. And so using that or knowing that fact in the story that there's no other way for Riot Black to get this information other than for Batgirl to give it to him when she dangles that in front of him, knowing that she has a plan to use that information against him, to use his need for that information against him, she is definitely defeating Riot Black with his pathology, just like I would maintain she learned from her mentor, Batman. That's what I mean by that. And there are... Tons of examples of this. Caleb and I have already recorded a few episodes of an animated discussion on BTAS, but that is a thing that from here on out, as we record, I will start pointing out for your benefit. Places that Batman defeats his villains with their own obsessions or madness or pathology or whatever. Great question, Susie. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy going and finding some of those examples. Like I say, they are all over Batman stories but they make great use of them in Batman the Animated Series. So a quick recap. When we last left Barbara, she'd moved into the trendiest neighborhood in Gotham, Burnside. She had a new roommate, a new costume, and let's be honest, a whole new set of problems. Her laptop had been stolen and wiped clean, which would be bad enough for any of us, but there's something else going on there that we're not quite sure of yet as readers, but we will find out this issue. 
She may have accidentally burned down the apartment of her now ex-best friend and new worst enemy, Dinah Lance, a.k.a. the Black Canary. That would be bad enough, but Dinah is also now sleeping on Barbara's couch in the apartment that Barbara moved into all of ten minutes ago, which is putting something of a strain on Barbara's relationship with her new roommate, Frankie. Barbara is low on cash for everything, but especially for new bat gear. She sunk a lot of money into the new costume. It pretty much wiped her out, and that's just going to be an ongoing problem as we roll forward. If you recall from the last session, that reminded me of some of my favorite stuff as Spider-Man. As a college student, that Peter Parker was always, he was more stable than when he was in high school. He had a job at the Daily Bugle, more or less, and He could afford to put gas in his motorcycle. Yes, Peter Parker had a motorcycle when he was in college, like a cool guy. So he could afford to feed himself and to keep rent basically paid. And But he was still running on enough of a shoestring budget that they could bring it up whenever they needed an extra plot knot for him to untangle. And I feel like that's where we're going with Barbara also. Worst of all, we ended the last issue with the realization that someone mysterious and unknown, has discovered Barbara Gordon's secret identity as Batgirl, and this unknown person is threatening her with this knowledge. So that's where we left Barbara. We pick her up in this issue on a shopping trip to replace Dinah's burnt wardrobe. Before we get into the story, I'm going to point out that this is another example of where fashion is a huge deal. I want you to, as you go, I'm not going to call out every single outfit because most of the time I don't know enough about fashion to say more than look how amazing this looks I wish I could dress this well however even though I'm not going to call out every single costume change I do want you to keep an eye on it Babs Tar has put a lot of work into everybody's style people have different styles Barbara's is very trendy but also appears to be very thrown together and Dinah is also very trendy, but with a side of punk rock. Later, we will see her in a very fetching, blousy top. But she's also wearing like uh, high-heeled black boots and torn jeans to go out. So she's on point, but in a punk way. Frankie tends to be more bright-colored and airy. I'm not going to call out every one of these. Just keep your eye on it. Fashion continues to be a huge part of this book, not just in Barbara's new Batgirl costume. Tech and social media, which we mentioned in the last session, also remain fundamental. They talk about how there are pictures of Batgirl fighting Riot Black on various social media platforms. And and uh, this is starting to gain her some traction in Burnside. She's starting to get some fans. That's going to become a thing. The costume itself even gets a shout out inside the fiction, which is a little bit self-serving at a meta level, but it actually makes sense. In the fiction, Barbara put a lot of effort into Batgirl looking good looking fashion forward and what do you know these trendy women of Burnside are noticing in a pretty brilliant bit of exposition to bring anybody who may have started with this issue up to speed we get a recap of Barbara's various problems about her money she's not she's not trying things on specifically because she can't afford anything in here anyway and even if she could she would use that on a new hard drive so she could fix her laptop In a conversation between Barbara and Dinah, we see that they are still very much at odds and that Dinah is aware of Barbara's secret identity trouble, including this new blackmail, but Frankie is not. Like, all this happens in the span of a page or two, and it's very good. And and of course, the biggest thing we're reminded is Barbara's secret identity is in jeopardy. As we go through this issue, I'm going to pull out some things, and maybe I'll make my notes available to the patrons later, and you can see that I bolded them in the notes, but... As we go, I'm going to call out these things that are going to remain a huge part of this first arc. And some of these things are really obvious. For instance, her secret identity is in jeopardy. I mentioned that at the end of last session. That's going to be a thing going forward. But there are going to be some other things that are significantly less obvious that almost seem like throwaway lines in this issue. But I'm going to point them out to you and say, keep your eye on this ball. It's going to be big for this arc. That's the opener. We get a big recap. We find out what the deal is. Remember who these couple of three main players are. It's pretty masterful. We're in and out very quickly. I never feel like I'm wasting time, even though I already know what happened. It feels very organic, this conversation. And in the meantime, we get to play with glamour and glitter, fashion and fame, which is a gem reference, not a Batgirl reference, but you get me. From our brief recap, 
we moved to Burnside College. And I'm excited about Burnside College for a couple of reasons. For one thing, we're finally going to get an answer to what's so damn important about the laptop. <laughs> for another one, I really appreciate how the hook check-in is used as a scene transition. Barbara Gordon checking in at Burnside College, hook. That continues to keep social media in our forefront, which is great and very important, I feel, to the demographic that this book is supposed to be emulating and written to and written by. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to beat that drum too hard as we go forward, but it just keeps it right there front and center. And lastly, as we go, we're going to get introduced to the work friends, right? A lot of superhero comics have completely forgotten the importance and usefulness of supporting casts. This is a thing they could relearn from our sexy nighttime superhero shows like Flash, Arrow, although Arrow's probably overdoing it a little bit, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I assume, because I haven't watched a whole lot of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., because every time I try, I get super bored. But there is a supporting cast. There's a group of people working together. And a lot of superhero books have just completely forgotten that. Once upon a time, all these people that Superman worked with were really important to his life as Clark Kent. And now it's basically Lois, right? Sometimes Jimmy. But we used to know all kinds of stuff about his editor, Perry White, and his frenemy, Steve Lombard, who was a total ass. But everybody's got that guy at work, including Clark Kent. And the woman that he's not really interested in, but is interested in him, in Cat Grant, which I know is hard to believe if you're coming to that character from Supergirl. But anyway, these supporting casts, they used to matter. You had the same thing with Spider-Man. You had the same thing with Daredevil and in the law office and other people he ran into at the courthouse. These things used to be important. They've kind of fallen off. I love that Batgirl is taking the time to build up a supporting cast for Barbara at home that is different than Barbara at work. We have not one but two supporting casts. It sounds really ambitious compared to other superhero books, but I think it should be standard operating procedure. And as we go, there may be some overlap and some change, and some of those people may become important to Barbara as Batgirl, and other people become less good. Anyway, you get it. It's great. The first thing we're going to do here on Burnside College is slowly introduce Barbara's academic woes. Like, even more slowly than we have already. Enter Jeremy DeGroote. Okay, so we have yet another new character. And he is a professor, albeit a young one, apparently. And he knows of Barbara's work. He knows who she is and knows the professor that she's there to see, George Krupke. Because Professor Krupke is excited about her work... He has talked to Jeremy about Barbara's work. Jeremy knows. Jeremy's saying everybody's really excited about it. And that sets us up to it sets us up to expect things here. Barbara is not going to be an unknown commodity toiling in the mines. She is not an established veteran at Burnside College by any stretch, but she is somebody that they have expected and are expecting great things from. Jeremy is clearly supposed to be some kind of love interest for Barbara. It may not be a serious one, because we, we just get a few pages of them in this book and just a few panels in this particular scene. But he's clearly supposed to be some kind of love interest because Babs becomes adorkable around him. We go from Jeremy. He introduces Barbara to her research assistant. So enter Nandima Ali. Now, I don't know how typical it is for grad students to have research assistants, I understand that that's maybe not a thing that would actually happen, especially a grad student who is brand new to the program. I don't really know that stuff. I get where somebody who would complain about that is coming from, but it, that kind of gets filed under the same heading as the size of the apartments and friends or something like that, where it's just like, well, yeah, but it's TV. I mean, oh, yeah, but it's fiction. So lovely patron Susie is swooping in and suggesting that it's possible that Nadima is an undergrad looking for graduate research experience, that that's pretty common in her academic experience. And you know what? I love it. I love that we had an explanation. At any rate, Nadima is going to be Barbara's research assistant, and she is the new work friend, which is great because we're rounding out that supporting cast all over the place, right? Talking about Nadima. I appreciate the instant bonding that happens between Barbara and Nadima. Like, it's right away. And it should be, because Nadima is clearly invested in Barbara's research. She's heard of her also. Nadima is also likable and normal. And go with me here for a minute. I'm going to say something that may sound a little offensive, but go with me. 
She's likable and normal, and there is instant bonding between Barbara and Nadima. Air quotes, despite the fact that Nadima is clearly a Muslim. She's wearing a hijab. That's a Muslim signifier. Now, I'm not, I don't really mean despite her being a Muslim. Because anybody who is likable and normal, you can be friends with. Anybody. I believe this 100%, right? It only makes sense that Barbara and Nadima should bond here. But that we are so clearly given a signifier of Nadima's religion and that it is probably different than Barbara's. You know, we don't really talk about the Bat family's religion that much, although I do have thoughts. But it's probably different than Barbara's, but it is in no way a hang-up for either one of them. And this is, this is important for a variety of reasons. First of all, Barbara is young in the year of our Lord 2014 when this book came out. She's already moved to the trendy hip neighborhood where she's going to run into a lot of people with lifestyles and upbringings and whatnot that are very different than hers, or at least very different than mine. So right away, she's open to these experiences, right? Or at least it seems like she would be. And again, Nadima is likable and normal. It does not matter for their friendship that she's Muslim, but it does matter a huge amount that she is an on-screen normal, likable Muslim person where her religion is not the point of her character. It reminds me very much of last session when we talked about Frankie's sexuality or Barbara's old roommate, Alicia's transgenderism, and that these are things that are about their character. They're important to who that character is, but they are not the reason that the character is in the book. We would never think that Frankie is Barbara's gay friend or bisexual friend. She's just her friend who happens to be gay and bisexual. And here we are with Nadima saying, this isn't Barbara's Muslim friend. This is her friend who happens to be Muslim. And I make such a big deal out of this because it ought to be unremarkable, and it just isn't. It is very remarkable. I want it to be unremarkable, but it isn't yet. So we're going to remark on it. We're going to call it out. Also, not for nothing, I did some research to find out about this, but as far as fashion goes... Apparently, Nadima's hijabi style is on fleek. That's quoting several sources on the internet. That's not a word that I use all the time, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm led to believe. Ethan, I agree with you. I think, I think it's a specific, purposeful choice to diversify this cast. Every single time this creative team chooses to introduce somebody who is not a straight white person, it is on purpose. And you know what? That's how we have to do it right now. It's how I have to do it as a creator myself. I can either be part of the solution or part of the problem. I don't want to read stories that are all about straight white people myself anymore. So I'm writing the fiction I want to write. It does mean more research for myself because I want to make sure I do it well. But nevertheless, yeah, it's it's an intentional choice. Now, in this scene, Nadima plays three crucial roles. One, she finally lets us understand why the laptop is such a big deal. The algorithm that is the cornerstone of Barbara's graduate work is gone. It's vanished. It was on the laptop, and now it's erased. Two, she explains why Jeremy is such a terrible dating prospect. This is really important as we go forward trying to figure out what kind of love interest he is. We have to make sure that he's a complicated one, if nothing else. Because all work romances are. That's true for fiction in real life, in my experience. Uh, But to be specific, Nadima mentions he's 32, which is ancient, and which, by the way, broke my 40-year-old heart. And she mentions that Jeremy is damaged goods. He has an ex that he's apparently not over, or he at least likes to bring up now and then, apparently in a sad panda way. Three, she introduces her brother, Kadir. We'll get to him in the next scene, but introducing him is really important, not just to this issue, but to the issues coming up. And then she does a fourth thing, which I don't feel is crucial, but I really like as far as spinning the plate of other story things. She reminds us that everyone is using Hook. If you know where this story is going, if you've read to the end already, you know that that's actually a fourth crucial thing. But I'm going to stay away from it. So we read together, so it's not spoilery, so it probably should be counted as a crucial thing, but for now I'm just going to say it's spinning that plate. So we go from Nadima to her brother, Kadir Ali. Kadir is going to be vital to Batgirl in this very issue, but right now he's vital to Barbara. And he spins that whole laptop academic woes plate 
it's pretty smooth storytelling. I mentioned this in the first session. This book never stops. There is always something going on. We're meeting a new person. We're getting a new relationship established. We have multiple plots going on at the same time, and it's all being handled in a very believable way. Even the plots that can't really progress yet, like, for instance, Barbara's academic woes, are given a touch to keep the plate going. And right here, Kadir gives her the first positive news that she has on that front, a big, fat hard drive that she can somehow use to hopefully get the algorithm back on her laptop. I'm not a tech person, and I don't understand it. It sounds like alchemy, but it seems legit. Secondly, in the scene, we discover that Kadir is very nice and very normal. And just like his sister, it shouldn't be a thing. But it is. He may not actually be religious. He may not be a Muslim like his sister. But, you know, he was raised in the same family and odds are that he is. And the fact that he's, again, a second, likable, normal, immediately friendly Muslim shouldn't be remarkable. It is. It's remarkable. I already mentioned he fills one really important plot structure on the academic problems front. But while Barbara is visiting his lab, he also introduces part of this issue's MacGuffin. There's been a theft of two prototype super motorcycles. And I think that's pretty cool also that even when she's just being Barbara, she's still detecting things. And I think that that's both because of her experience of Batgirl and because of the house that she was raised in with Jim Gordon, Super Cop. We'll talk more about that as the issue progresses. But there's a police officer there. He's filling out reports. Everybody seems very on edge a little bit. And she's like, hey, what's going on? And she discovers, what do you know? There's been a theft on campus, and it's very mysterious. Now, if Bruce Wayne were here, he would immediately be going, well, I'll be back tonight to check on what's going on as Batman. I don't think she's doing that. Now, we're going to find out that it's tied to stuff she has to do with Batgirl, but I don't think she's currently planning to come back and look into it. It's just a thing she notices because she's Barbara Gordon and she's Batgirl. And then lastly, we get this beat on the way out of the lab that I think is amazing. And it's that Barbara stops, takes a look at a dry erase board, and then incidentally fixes a theorem for some guys. And she does this because she's brilliant. Right? We know she's brilliant, but this is a really great story beat and a cool like mic drop moment, or I guess in this case marker drop moment for her to have and then walk out the door. It's a little cliche, I guess, and maybe some people would find it a little heavy handed, but for my purposes, I cannot be reminded that she is brilliant and competent enough. From here, we go to the courtyard at Burnside College. We get a little bit of technology as she shoots a quick text to Frankie. To, again, spin that Barbara academic woes slash laptop plate. Keep that story in motion. But then the MacGuffin from the lab thickens into an actual Batgirl plot. Let's never forget that when Barbara hears the frightened cries for help, she runs toward the danger. She is a heroic person. And what does she find? Two brightly garbed girls are menacing students, and they just happen to be riding super motorcycles. Hmm. Seems like a clue to Kadir's lab theft. And she does have kind of a quick little flashback where she's comparing the stuff she overheard about the motorcycle with the motorcycle she's looking. And boom, we now have a Batgirl plot. She rushes into a bathroom and we get a costume change. And it's very short. It's like five or six panels right there. And I love it as a montage. I have got a lot of feelings about superheroes empowering themselves through changing their clothes, and I think that this is especially true for female superheroes, and I'm not going to go into all of those thoughts right now, but you will eventually have to hear all of them in my upcoming animated discussion podcast about Sailor Moon Crystal that will be forthcoming after I finish the B-Taz one. So watch this space, I'll keep you in the loop. And when we talk about the transformation scenes for Sailor Moon and the rest of the Senshi, you're going to hear all kinds of things that I think about costume changes. But I think they're important. I think changing your clothes in real life is important. And in superhero stories, it should be a thousand times more important and powerful. And I think kids get that because kids want to see Clark can't rip the shirt. Kids want to see Batman and Robin go down the poles as Bruce and Dick and come out as Batman and Robin. Like, those things are appealing in a totemic way. Okay, Ethan, Bat Prism Power Makeup is so... 
you've probably seen the line art thing. I know I shared it on Facebook not very long ago of Bruce Wayne having a magical girl transformation. And the only thing that would make it better was if it was Barbara That's or Cass. That's the only way it would be better. I think boys with transformation scenes are also really cool. Note Batman 66 with the poles or Billy Batson saying Shazam. It's cool all the time, but it, it's... Anyway, Kate and I have already had a conversation about transformation scenes and girls and the girl power that comes along with it. So, whoo, buckle up for that. Batgirl is now on the scene. What does a bystander who just a moment ago was running for their life stop and do? Get a picture, they say. That's going on the internet, you guys. So, interesting tidbit. The villains actually seem pleased to see Batgirl. We get a very dramatic panel where we can see their faces through the motorcycle helmets, and they're smiling. They are happy to see Batgirl, and they pull swords at that moment. As soon as Batgirl shows up, they are pleased to move from mayhem directly to murder. Very interesting. Nothing to worry about, I'm sure. So as Barbara faces these twins, she remains extremely competent. But she also admits that they're very good. And she admits this to herself right as they cut her jacket and wound her lightly. And she is upset about how she just bought this jacket, which is another callback to those money troubles. Now, neither the wound nor the mending of the jacket are going to come back in an important way in this issue. And I feel like that's a missed opportunity. I don't know what I wanted to see there. She brings it up herself in the moment and her money troubles are an ongoing issue. And so I just... I don't know. She has a bandage on her arm later, but I would have liked to have seen something. You know, somebody taking a picture and noticing the tear in her jacket, a scene of her mending it. I I don't know exactly what I wanted. It just feels like there should be something there, and then later, there is not. Batgirl finds herself cornered after she's wounded, and she realizes she still doesn't have a grappling hook, which is like, first thing you get issued as a Bat Family person is a grappling hook, but she's working without her usual net. She still manages to escape up into the tree in a very cool parkour back and forth motion up the wall in the tree trunk, but barely. Campus cops, or is it the Gotham City cops from upstairs? I'm not sure, but at any rate, police show up and the fracas ends. But as the duo on the motorcycles leaves, they yell out a clue. Tomorrow cries danger. Back at the apartment. We spin that school laptop plate again, just to remind us it's a thing. Now, When I am calling it out like this, how often they bring it up, it sounds annoying. But I have to tell you that as a reader, I really appreciate it. Frankie and Barbara are going to have a conversation. They needed to be doing something in the room while they were having a conversation. It is good writing to make that thing they're doing something else to do with the story, right? That's just smart. So even though it sounds like I'm bringing it up a lot because they bring it up a lot, I feel like it works very organically and is and is just good writing. Don't let us forget any of Barbara's problems. We need to know them constantly. While Barbara and Frankie are busy being big nerds with their computers, Dinah comes out and declares she's going out for the evening. She looks amazing. The fashion is back. And we also see both in her dialogue and her outfit that she's too cool for school as far as these nerds are concerned, and also probably too punk rock for Burnside. As she leaves, we discover that, what do you know, Frankie is tired of Dinah's emotional mess, and she should be, right? Let's remember, Dinah's crashing on her couch, she and Frankie don't know each other, and Dinah is not being very nice to anybody, but particularly probably to Barbara, who Frankie sometimes feels a little protective of. But Barbara's a friend to a fault, defends Dinah. She's going through a tough time. Please let her stay a little while longer. Frankie lets it go. She suggests that maybe this is just because she's tired from her job at Hook. The code is getting incredibly complex. The updates are coming faster and faster. This seems like it could be a throwaway line. It's just a thing to justify her annoyance in that moment. But let me tell you, having read to the end, I'm tired from my job at Hook is going to become very important to this arc's plot. So, keep your eye on that ball. Also, code's getting really complex. All these programmers can barely keep up with it. Nothing to worry about, I'm sure. We take a step back from that before before too much attention is called to it and we all start to wonder what's going on before it's time in the story. Hint, hint. We pull back from that and Barbara introduces Adamina. 
which sort of strikes me as a Astro Boy with a feminine twist, like it's an homage to the old Japanese manga Astro Boy, which is one of the most famous pieces of manga in Japanese history. It is hugely significant both to their comic book culture and to ours. It eventually worked its way into America in various ways that I will not go into now. But along with Sailor Moon, Astro Boy is one of the most influential manga on American comics that was originally influenced by American cartoons, and you see how everybody influences everybody. Barbara is reminded of Adamina because she remembers that the villains she fought earlier look like Adamina bad guys, the Jawbreakers. The Jawbreakers looked like those girls in costume and yelled that catchphrase, Tomorrow Cries Danger. And the Jawbreakers were particularly frightening to seven-year-old Barbara. That takes us into The Robot Pony, a hobby shop for nerds, apparently especially anime nerds. And this is not me casting shade on hobby shops for nerds. As you can imagine, I have spent more than my fair share in various hobby shops for nerds, which is why I can say that that's what this is. And I can also say that this one's kind of a shitty hobby shop. In every shitty hobby shop I've ever gone to, there is always this asshole behind the counter. And here we have him right here questioning everybody's commitment to his niche of subculture. Way to go, guy. He's the one who tells Barbara that Adamina is actually science battle hero Nuclea, and the jawbreakers are actually Kuchi Shifutago, the mouth death twins. In the process, this guy reminds us he's still a dick. Not for nothing, I think that that guy is something of a commentary on what was going on already for new female fans of this Batgirl book, coming into the fandom. They were definitely hearing from this guy or someone very like him when they read about this book in Entertainment Weekly and then tried to go get one at the comic shop. Thankfully, Adamina is niche enough that the guy IDs the perps as local cosplay otaku Yuki and Yuri Katsura. As Barbara leaves the store, she tries to use a backdoor hack into the Gotham City Police Department database to look for the Katsura twins, but she's shut down despite her intimate knowledge of the system. Seems like a thing to just make her life a little more complicated, to make the plot a little more complicated. But if you're a writer or an astute reader, you might wonder, then why even mention it? Well, let me tell you something, kids. As you go forward, it's going to be a thing that you'll look back on and say, oh, hey, that was really important. But for now, I will say nothing to worry about, I'm sure. From there, we return to Kadir's lab as Batgirl. Kadir gets very excited. He's apparently kind of a Batgirl fan. And he just liked her fan page, and she can't believe that she even has a fan page. I'll point out that this is spinning the social media plate that is going on all the time to give this story verisimilitude with the target audience. But I'm also going to call it out as another thing that is going to become more and more important to the plot of this arc as we go. So keep your eye on that ball. We get another example of Batgirl detecting things like a boss. She notices the footprints that are in a motorcycle boot. And while sure, you've got a bunch of nerds who are building super motorcycles, so maybe some of them wear motorcycle boots, she also notices that these never break stride as they're moving through the security doors. They never have to stop to scan their card. The doors just open for them. And so not only does she detect things, she does it in a very believable old school way because let's remember, right now, she does not have access to every piece of technology and gear that she ought to because she's Batgirl on a budget. She asks very nicely and she gets her grapple gun from Kadir and it establishes Kadir as her gearhead. It's going to be a while before she can resupply from whatever basements Batman has hidden around Gotham. He probably doesn't have one in Burnside at all. Maybe. They never really talk about it. But here we're establishing Kadir, one of Barbara's own existing, new, on-campus supporting cast, as Batgirl's gearhead. And that's pretty fun, especially because we're going to see that Kadir remains a Batgirl fan until it's extremely important that he's not. Shh, we'll talk about that more later. Mysteriously, just as Batgirl seems to come to a dead end in her investigation, the GPS comes on. Obviously, that's really important to this moment in the story to keep it moving, but I will also file this under nothing to worry about, I'm sure. 
We moved from Kadir's lab directly to the warehouse hideout with the assistance of the GPS tracker. And the GPS turns out to be hooked to an Adamina doll that comes like shuffling, walking out of the shadows. And I have to tell you, it's a cool moment that is probably a lot scarier to me than it's meant to be because this looks like one of the terrifying things that a Gotham villain would do right before it explodes or turns out to be hooked to a bunch of kids that are hanging over a vat of acid or something like that. The Jawbreakers are not those kind of villains, not by a stretch. But because we are at least Gotham adjacent, there was a moment in my mind when I was like, what horrible thing is this child's toy going to do? And it turns out it was just being creepy and having a GPS hook to it. Enter the Jawbreakers. It's a really good fight between Batgirl and the Jawbreakers. She is still incredibly competent and confident, but they are also very good at what they do. They have weapons and they have super motorcycles while she's on foot. It's a great beat that she is so competent and confident, but that the writers have given them reasons to close the gap and keep it dangerous for her. I also like how she uses the environment and their outfits against them. It shows creative thinking on Barbara's part without relying on luck. She uses what's around her in a smart, dangerous way, but not in a, oh, look, there's a tire that I can throw on them like a bunch of 80s cartoons would have done. Or I'm going to throw my battering to cut that rope and drop a bunch of stuff on them. Lucky it was there. No, she's just using the battlefield. That's great. Unfortunately, they are pretty good. The second jawbreaker cuts the first jawbreaker's coat, leaving Barbara in the dust. It's at this moment that we slip into a memory-driven version of Detective Vision, and I love it. Like, I'm just getting that out of the way right now. I really like this because it's still Detective Vision. We still get the blue signifiers, and it's still using Barbara's eidetic memory. But now it's very... Now it's personally memory-driven as opposed to detail memory-driven. And so we have Batgirl observing Baby Babs watching Adamina. And then Batgirl slips into Baby Babs' place and the POV flips a few times. It's kind of cool. There's probably a lot of good psychological things we could tease out of there. And maybe I will for the next session of the seminar if anybody cares. But this is also where we are shown a very cool character beat. A very interesting and impactful character beat. Batman may have made Barbara Gordon into Batgirl, but way before that, James Gordon made his daughter Barbara the kind of woman who could become Batgirl. Observe and analyze, Barbara, just like I taught you. That's what Jim Gordon says to his scared little girl. When you are scared, observe and analyze, just like I showed you. That is an amazing character beat for Barbara and honestly also for Jim Gordon. We haven't seen him in this book except in this memory, But he taught her things. He was a cop who knew his daughter was super smart way before his daughter realized she should be Batgirl. And I I really like that beat. I like a father-daughter beat there where we get to see Jim Gordon help his scared little girl in a way that makes sense for Jim Gordon. That brings us back to Batgirl's present where she is fighting the Jawbreakers. She proceeds to defeat them the same way that Adamina does. And it's worth pointing out, she defeats them with their pathology. These two girls, cosplaying as the Jawbreakers, are so committed to the role that they even attack in the same way that the characters attacked on the show. Barbara knows this, she sees this, and she uses it against them with the assistance of her brand new grapple gun. This is a side note that isn't interesting to anybody but me, probably, but... That grapple gun looks a lot like the one from Batman 89, the movie with Michael Keaton and Kim Basinger and Jack Nicholson. And I know that because I built my own version of it several times out of several different types of materials, including a broken hairdryer at one point. I know what that thing looks like, and it's definitely reminiscent of Batman 89. But she uses the grapple to trip them up. She steals one of the bikes. They start riding chicken. Her on the bike and them riding chicken at one another is used to set up a sick action movie stunt. I love that jump off the bike, knee to the face. In fact, the only thing that makes me sad about it is that she doesn't make a joke about jawbreakers. Because she kicked her in the face on a motorcycle. Seems like that would have an effect on one's jaw. Maybe it's not enough of an effect, 
but they are called jawbreakers. <laughs> I feel like she should have taken advantage of that at some point in this story. She ties up the jawbreakers, and this leads to the big reveal that makes us realize even as Batgirl is solving this problem, the plot is thickening. The jawbreakers tell her that they were hired by a mysterious, apparently fake, Batgirl. They thought it was the real Batgirl. They thought that the Batgirl that hired them is the same Batgirl that they're fighting, but apparently not. But this fake Batgirl is still a hacker extraordinaire, just like Barbara is. And you can tell that because of the way that the jawbreakers were paid. That money came from nowhere, as near as they could tell. And the lab theft itself. All the security in the lab was already overcome by the time the jawbreakers got there. What's more, the mystery Batgirl knows Barbara intimately. She doesn't just know Batgirl's secret identity. She knows Barbara intimately. And you can tell this because she picked these two people to threaten Batgirl because, heavily reminiscent, of one of Barbara's childhood fears. Only somebody who knows more than just her secret identity could send somebody against Barbara that would prey upon something that frightened seven-year-old baby Babs. Before we go on to the epilogue of this particular issue, I want to point out what the Jawbreakers make me think about, because this is going to become more of a thing in the coming issues. The Jawbreakers make me think about the modern American cult of fame. I'm not going to pontificate about this too much. I haven't done a ton of research on it. This is a person who takes in a lot of media commenting on something. But I think we all realize we live in a society now where there are a bunch of people who feel invisible. And they are willing to do dangerous or dastardly or even just stupid things in order to become famous just for a hot second. And they'll do these things just to become social media famous. Not to put too fine a point on it, but this makes me think of basically every mass shooter. Almost every one of those guys was just doing it to be seen. And then we've even had conversations about how the news covers them after that, that we say their names a billion times over and over and give them exactly the thing that they want, that fame, that hot minute of being famous. But they had to do something evil in order to do it. But they were willing to do the evil thing to get that return of fame. That's a thing. It's a thing we're struggling with as a society. It's a thing that Batgirl is going to struggle with both herself and struggle against outside of herself in the coming issues. And I want to point out, this very week, there was an issue of Superman where he defended undocumented immigrants from dangerous white people. And of course, as you would predict, there are a bunch of angry white people who may or may not even be comic book nerds, although that line is pretty blurry at this point right now. But as you could predict... Angry white people are like, why would Superman be defending these illegal immigrants? Isn't he all about truth, justice, and the American way? Never mind the fact that, A, Superman is an undocumented American, an illegal immigrant himself. B, he is always the person who steps up to protect those who can't protect themselves from the bullies. And lastly, comic books are political. They've always been political. And I say all that to say, this very week you have people calling for comic books not to be political when that's their job and you're seeing that happen right here in Batgirl. We are using superhero nonsense to comment on a conversation we are having about our real world society right now. And they did it without doing something fundamentally character breaking and fantastically stupid like making Captain America a Nazi and then pretending like that's not a thing people should be upset about. So I really appreciate that kind of smart social commentary done through a superhero story that never stops being a superhero story. Not unlike Nadima and Kadir's religion, not unlike Frankie's sexuality, not unlike Alicia Yeo's gender identity, these things should not be remarkable, but they are. And so we will remark upon them and applaud them as they deserve. So we go from the warehouse to the epilogue. The epilogue is back on campus at Burnside. They are in a meeting room, Barbara and Nadima and Jeremy. So we are back to our work friends. This issue introduced them 
and then cements them. We did have some scenes at home with Dinah and Frankie because, of course, Barbara goes home sometimes. But this issue has very much been about these people that we need to be getting to know in this issue. So here we are wrapping up this issue with an epilogue involving the work friends. They are very enthusiastic about Barbara's research. Nadima is excited to get to work on it. Now, maybe that's not a big deal, right? But I think we've all had group projects at work where everybody wasn't excited to work on them. And the feeling of somebody actually being invested in your project is is a big deal. And we should go back to that Nadima and Barbara bonding thing. But it also reminds us that Barbara's work is interesting and exciting and big. Big enough to get the attention of kind of the whole department. Nadima can't wait to go to work on it. Jeremy can't wait to hear more about it. Kadir the Batgirl fanboy comes into the room and he is over the moon that the superbikes were returned by Batgirl. His excitement and delight over that is just a joy for me to see. He is also a way to accidentally spill the beans about the fact that Barbara has lost her algorithm. This mortifies Barbara in front of both Jeremy and Nadima, and she tries to cover it up and is only successful because Frankie walks in. Of course, Frankie walks in and accidentally spills the beans about Barbara thinking Jeremy is cute. And now the room is super awkward. And just like at the end of the last issue, Batgirl has won and Barbara has lost a little of her dignity. That is going to continue to be an ongoing thing where Batgirl's life is on the upswing and Barbara's is neutral to negative. And I like it. I like that tension between secret identities. Let's be honest, if we could put on a costume and go punch bad people, we would feel like that life was very simple compared to our workaday lives. And I also like that we end this book that has been a a little bit serious and a little bit heavy in some places, and that has done some pretty masterful social commentary. We end it with a very light, funny, sitcom moment, and I really appreciate that. And without calling out any names... I'm going to tell you that in research for the seminar, I ran into a couple of people who generally know what they're talking about, but when they were talking about this specific issue, and it was an older article, so I think they were talking about this issue when it came out, they just really didn't get it. They didn't get all kinds of things. They didn't get some of the feminine aspects that I feel are inherent to this. They didn't get some of the millennial aspects. They want to talk crazy talk about how Barbara's really Batgirl and Barbara's the disguise, which is nonsense for Bruce Wayne and Batman, but is like a billion times worth of nonsense for Batgirl. They want to talk about details like how the boots wouldn't fit in her backpack. Like anybody cares. The point of that scene was for her to have a costume montage, not to talk about what fits in the backpack. Let's not even talk about what fits in Batman's utility belt. It doesn't matter. Also, though, they completely missed the point of this light sitcom moment. This is a big deal. It's funny. It shows not only that Batgirl wins and Barbara loses thing, but it lets us deflate some of the tension that we know is building with all these hints that have come through this issue. It lets us deflate some of the tension that we have with the very good social commentary. It gives us a smile that is completely in keeping with all of these characters' characters. Everybody acts the way that they should act in this scene. And at the end, Barbara is mortified. Jeremy's embarrassed. Kadir and Nadima are very amused. And Frankie doesn't know what she's done. And if you compare this to that scene, they're very different scenes, but if you compare this to the scene where Barbara came back with Dinah in tow to the apartment in the last issue, where we could tell that this was a very awkward situation for everybody in very different ways, you get that again here and a little bit of a chuckle. And I'm telling you, that's the way to end this this issue. I don't want to speak too much for the target demographic, but this is the way that I would want that kind of issue to end. We've done all of these very important things. We have at least commented on several important things. We have spun a bunch of story plates. We have had some really good action. We have had a really strong character beat between a girl and her father in her memory. We've had a lot of stuff happen in this book. End on a laugh. End on a laugh. And that brings us to the end of this issue of Batgirl of Burnside and the end of seminar number two, the Burnside College Try. But I hope that you will all join me 
for seminar number three, as we go into the third part of this story, where we really see a lot of the identity issues and the social media and the commentary on fame really starts to bubble up to the surface and become the main plot. After that, we're kind of over the hump and sliding into the big plot, the big bad of this first arc. So it's a pretty exciting and pretty pivotal couple of issues that we're coming into, and I'm really excited to talk about them with you all next time. See you then. Superhero University is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, Check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. And if you can't support us financially, please leave the show a rating and review on iTunes. It's the best way to help others discover the show. Keep up with Pulp Diction news by following our host on Twitter at Joshua Unruh. Or find us at facebook.com slash Pulp Diction Productions.